And all I want to do Is lay it all down Pour it all out at your feet This past week, my brother Jerry, who watches us online, probably watching us this morning. Hi, Jerry. He just celebrated his 72nd birthday. And that's old, you know, that's old. I used to think it was real old. He's always been old to me. But every time I get older, the bar of old goes up. So when I was a kid, I thought 50 was old until I became 40. And then 60 seemed old until I became 50. And, And then 70 seemed old, but I'm 62. I'll be 62 next month. And so I think old is like 80 or 90 or somewhere up there, right? You know, I went went online to find out, how do you really know if you're old? Well, you know, the the source of all great truth is found on the internet. And if you just Google it, you can find out. So I found out some tests to determine if you're getting old. And here are some some of the things. If you qualify for these, you are old. If your knees buckle, but your belt doesn't, you're old. If you sink your teeth into a big stake and they stay there, you're old. Oh, you're old if you wear socks with your sandals. You're old if if you fall asleep and and your kids shake you to see if you're dead. You're old if you throw a big party and your neighbors don't even notice. You're getting old when you sneeze and get hurt. You're old when you pay more for the candles than the cake. Here's a sign that you're old. You see an antique and remember when you bought one of those when they first came out. <laughs> and this one I'm sharing with you from Gary Smalley when he was here at our church. He says, you're old when your wife invites you to go upstairs to make love and you've got a choice of one or the other. <laughs> Some people think you get old when you have grandkids. But I became a grandfather when I was 47. And when our granddaughter was born, our only granddaughter, our daughter told us, you've got to come up with a name different than grandma and grandpa because someone took it. I didn't know someone could actually take that name before we had a chance to own it. So I said, all my whole life I was looking forward to being a grandpa. I'm not going to be called grandpa. So so they said, also, you cannot take the name Mimi or Papa. That's gone off the table too. And I said, what's left? So my wife says, well, I think I want to be called Bibi, which is Swahili for grandmother. See, my, my wife knew a lady. Her name was Bibi Burks, she taught at a Bible college in Tanzania. And the reason she knew that was because her cousin's wife was the granddaughter. And when Julie was leading a team from our church in 2004 to go to Tanzania, she says, why don't you visit my grandmother when you're there? She teaches at a Baptist Bible college. So when Julie got there with the team, she inquired of the missionaries if they knew about the college. They did. They also knew about B.B. Burks. And so when Julie went to the Bible college, she introduced herself, and then the woman turned around and introduced my wife to their whole class, saying, this is my kin, Julie. And then after the class, she took her back to an apartment, and they sat down, and that's when Julie really heard this lady's story. See, when she was 75 years old, she says, God woke her up one night and said, you need to go back to college and get your Bible degree and go teach. So she says, I was a little slower than some. It took me five years to get my degree. And then she was hired by a Bible college in Tanzania. And by the time my wife got there to see her, she was 90 years old. Wow. 90 years old. A relentless servant. An inspiration to a generation. See, I think we bought into a lie from our culture that, that when you get to the age of retirement, it's time to kind of slow down, wind things down. You've done your time. You've served. Kind of kick back. Uh, just, just kind of cruise until that time when you're going to go to the cemetery. And that's a lie of our culture. Don't, don't let your peers put a damper on your passion. Growing old doesn't have to turn your passion cold. See, God is in the business of transforming broken people into his relentless, loving servants. We talked about that the last couple of weeks, how we're broken and God actually takes us like a pot of clay and begins to form us and shape us and fires us and makes us into a vessel that's set apart holy for his use, his noble purposes. And then he fills us with things like grace and truth and love and joy and justice. And we pour that out to the people he's called us to serve. Every one of us have been called. It is our identity in Christ. It's not just something we do because that's what Jesus did, but it's something we are because that's who Jesus was. He says, I've not come to be served, but to serve and give myself as a ransom for many. 
And so when we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, there's no greater call than to be a servant like him. And we do it until the day we die, until the Lord calls us home. If you ever flip through the pages of the New Testament and look at the, those who wrote the books, they'll often identify who they are. And sometimes they'll say things like, I'm an apostle. But more often than not, this is their title. Paul says it a number of times. Paul, servant of Jesus Christ. Peter, servant of Jesus Christ. Jude, servant of Jesus Christ. James, servant of Jesus Christ. What's going to follow your name? Christian isn't definitive enough. What does that mean? Servant says it all. You are never more like Christ than when you serve like Christ. It is our identity, and we do it until the day we die. We are relentless in service, and nobody sets the bar for relentless service like a man in the Old Testament named Caleb. Caleb, his name means brave. It means wholehearted. Some scholars think that his name came from a Hebrew word, Caleb, which means dog. It's interesting because Caleb was like a dog on a bone. Caleb had determination, grit. He was dogged in his pursuit of God's plan for his life. We need to be like Caleb. And what I'm going to talk about today applies to everyone, but especially to those of us who are older. How are you to find that? Getting to a stage of life where we're thinking about, what am I going to do when I get to this time when I can start to slow down? I'm going to say, hey, you need to rethink that out. This is not the time to slow down. This may be the time to speed it up. There are four characteristics of Caleb that I want to look at today. And the first one is Caleb had an uncommon devotion to Jesus Christ. Relentless servants share that uncommon devotion to Jesus Christ. In the book of Joshua, we come to the place where the Israelites who wandered for 40 years have come to the edge of the promised land for a second time. And this time, they're going to go in and claim the land. And so Joshua is giving tracts of land to different tribes. And it says that the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when the Moses... When Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But the brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. Now, if you rewind the clock 40 years, some of you know the story. The Israelites were rescued from Egypt. God took them through the desert, did a lot of miracles in the desert, and then he brought them to this place, the edge of the promised land. God then said, take a spy from each of the tribes, and they are to go into the land on a reconnaissance mission to, to gather information of what's in the land. And these spies spent 40 days going up and down all through that promised land. They came back and gave the report. And Caleb said, you know, it's a beautiful place. We ought to go take the land. But the other spies not, not only saw that the vegetation was great, they said the, the cities are fortified and the people are big. We don't think we should take it. And so because they didn't go into the land and rebelled against the Lord, they didn't trust that God could defeat those enemies through them. They wandered for 40 years until every single man that was alive then died, except for two. Joshua and Caleb. Now here they are, 40 some years later. Now I want to go back to the actual event the first time around. When they got to Kadesh Barnea, here's what happened. They come back with this report that they're afraid of what's there, but it says, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. And then the men who'd gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Then they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that saw it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. These are big people. And some of the spies came back saying, oh my goodness, when we stand next to them, we look like grasshoppers. We're just bugs. They're going to squash us. And Caleb said, no, they won't. God's on our side. We should go forward. But since they didn't trust the Lord, they made this circular route for 40 years. But Caleb was different, had a different spirit. He was, he was, 
He was uncommon. He wasn't like his peers. He had an uncharacteristic devotion to the Lord. And I want to ask you something, especially those of you who are getting to a stage of life where you're retired or thinking of retirement. Are you going to go down the path of, of the culture which says, okay, now you've got time to make it all about you. This is a season of life that you can do the things you've always wanted to do. You've worked for your company. You've served your family. Now it's your time. Kick back. Enjoy life. Or is it a time to say, you know what? I've got to figure out what God wants me to do with this season of life. I know that we're not the same as we were before. We're not as young as we were once before. And sometimes I can even feel myself saying, man, my body just doesn't rebound the way it did before when I do yard work or lift heavy things. You know, I'm not the same. You know, I've lost some of the stamina and some of the strength. But I'll tell you this. We have gained far more than we've ever lost. We have more, as you get older, you have more time than you've ever had before. Your kids are grown. You're not, you're not devoting 40, 50 hours to your job. You've got more time than you've ever had before. You probably have more money than you've ever had before. You've been promoted multiple times. You're not putting kids through college. You may have, have, your, you may have your mortgage paid off. You've got more money than you've ever had. You know what else you have? More knowledge, more wisdom, more experience than you've ever had the entire uh, prior period of your life. You have more talent and skill. You have more connections from all the relationships you built up over the years. You have more opportunities before you to choose from, and therefore you can have a greater impact than you've ever had before. Quit telling yourself you don't have much anymore. Yes, you don't have as much physical strength, but in every other area of life, you have more than you've ever had before. So what are you going to do with all that wealth? How are you going to steward it for the Lord? Be like a Caleb. Devote it to the Lord. You know, when my daughter went to Bible college in California, there was a group of people that would travel in every summer. They'd spend a couple weeks on campus. They'd bring in their motorhomes and RVs. And they were retired people who actually spent their summers, and I think actually they spent most of their year traveling around as a group from Bible college to Bible college to Christian camp to parachurch ministry, and they volunteer their time to do whatever that ministry needs. And so they'll work. And in our case, they were renovating the dorms for the students. And they would work during the day, and they would have dinners together at night, and they would laugh and fellowship and worship together. And it was for the first time in their life, they got to be fully devoted to ministry. And my father-in-law, who's, who's kind of our Velcro father-in-law, he said, without those folks, we never could have done what we did to that college. We needed those volunteers. What are you doing with all the wealth that God has given you? It's okay to travel, to golf, to play with the grandkids, to watch Wheel of Fortune. It's okay to do those things. But how are you stewarding all the wisdom, all the time, all the knowledge, all that experience that you've acquired over the years? Demonstrate an uncommon devotion. Don't do what everyone else is doing. Be different. Be like a Caleb. Second characteristic of Caleb and, un, and unrelenting servants is this. They have an unyielding grip on his promises. Caleb remembered the promise God made. He says in Joshua, Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot is trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. God made a promise that he would have land for him and his descendants. That promise continued to motivate him. He was now twice as old as he was before, but he wants what God had promised. God is faithful to his promises. I remember when I first became a believer, I started memorizing various scriptures. And most of them, when I reflect, were promises. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He promises he'll direct my paths. It says in Isaiah that he will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed on him. Learn in Philippians that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and that my God shall supply all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. I learned that those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. See, God has made promises to us that we can cling to and hold to because he's going to fulfill them in his time. Abraham 
knew that so well. That's why he's an example of what it means to trust God. When Paul writes about Abraham in in the book of Romans, the fourth chapter, he says this about him. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. I love that. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he'd promised. He promised he and Sarah they'd have a baby in their old years. He never, never let go of the belief that God would do that. See, I, I'm always reminded to go back to God's promise. What did God actually promise? Anytime we're looking for a staff person to fill a hole, like right now we're looking for a youth pastor, I remind myself, I remind our staff, Jesus said this, I will build my church. That's his promise. He never told us to build it. He said he'll build it. But here's what he did tell us. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. Okay, so let's pray. We're not going to panic. We're going to pray. God knows what we need. God knows who's out there. God knows who's best for us. And I remember a year ago when I was in a meeting when Wendy, our our gifted children's director, announced to her volunteers that she'd be leaving the church. God had really called her to go lead a Christian school. And so she shared that information um, that night uh, in the midst of all her volunteers. And I happened to be at the meeting, sitting at a table with a high school gal who was involved in our children's ministry, along with another woman, along with her son. It was Trinity Albertson. First time I've ever met Trinity. And I said, man, this gal loves those kids. She works with the three-year-olds. Her son also is involved in children's ministry. What a great family. And after the meeting that night, she actually went up to Wendy and says, I think God wants me to look into this position. And I didn't know it at the time that she was getting her doctorate in education and she'd just, and she'd been part of our church, but God was answering our prayer already. We kept looking out there. Where do we look? Where do we find this person? God says, it's right there in your midst. I've already provided her. I've already been preparing her for such a time as this. God is so faithful to his promises. I love this passage from 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, Paul says that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, was not yes and no, but in him it's always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. Meaning Jesus puts a green light on all those promises. You don't have to ask Jesus, do you, are you, is your promise good today? No, he says, they're all good. They're all good. That's why we say yes to him, because he's already said yes to us. Don't let go of your grip on his promises. Here's a third characteristic of a relentless servant, an undaunted reliance on his power. Caleb proclaims his faith this way. I'm still as strong today as it was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Here is this man, 85 years old. And it's not like 85 today. People live to about the year 80 in those days. He's surpassed it. He's like one of the oldest dudes around. And he says, I want what God told me I could have 45 years ago. And he says, test me, I'm as strong now as I was then. Now, you know you, probably, you could probably beat the guy up, possibly physically. But I'll tell you this, there is, a, there is a fight in the dog when you get older that younger people can't compete with. Mm-hmm. I can guarantee you this, if I met my 30-year-old me right now, I could take him down and kick his butt. <laughs> you could too, not, my, not me, but your 30-year-old kid, Okay. <laughs> You could. You know why? Not because you're physically stronger. But you have a fight in you that's determined and unyielding and will not lose, right? And that's to your credit. It's taken a lifetime to get to that place. And God has has put that as, you're watching now in sports, something that's never happened before. Uh, In almost every major sport, athletes will get into their 30s and say, you know, you know, the body's starting to get worn down. We need to start thinking retirement. So, you know, 32, 35, athletes start to leave their profession. Not anymore. You've got a 45-year-old quarterback who's playing at MVP caliber. Amen. You've, got, you've, got, you've got LeBron James, who's about 40 years old, playing basketball still. You've got Albert Pujols, who's in his 40s, knocking home runs for the St. Louis Cardinals. You've got hockey players in their 40s. Come on. These athletes are saying, don't tell my body that I'm old. That's right. There's, a, there's something still in me yet to give. 
We are as strong now, maybe stronger in some ways than we ever were before. You know, B.B. Burks, 90 years old, teaching in a Bible college. Wow, that's incredible. And you know, you know this guy, John Glenn. Yeah. John Glenn was in the, the, the first uh, space mission. And at the age of 77, he went back on the space shuttle, spent 11 days in orbit. Here's some people you've never heard of. Ethel Davy. She's a British lady. She started volunteering at a thrift store when she was 78. And for the last 21 years, get that, she's 99 now, she has not missed a single week of work. Fauja Singe, this guy, ran a marathon at the age of 104. Mm. Yeah, what's your excuse? <laughs> really? But this is, this is the one that gets me the most. Johanna Quas. Planking right there. Oh, my goodness. The world's oldest gymnast at the age of 86, and she didn't even start until she was 56. When others are thinking of retiring, she's picking up her mat. Come on. Quit saying you're getting old. We have a body that God has given us. Now, I know some of you have done a good job. You watch what you eat. You, you, you're keeping things under control. You're in shape. You're looking great for your age. Others have kind of let yourself go, and you've assumed a shape. <laughs> I'm not going to say what shape it is, but oh my goodness. you've assumed a shape. But this body should not hinder our service for the Lord. That's right. That's right. We need to take care of it so I can maximize my energy for God. I love what Paul says when he talked about his ministry, what, what spurred him on. He says, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now get this. For this I toil. It's work struggling, oh, that's work, with all his energy, that's, that he powerfully works within me. Somehow, God, God can energize a person to go beyond their own ability to do things that they never thought possible. Have you ever gone into that gear? To where you, you instead of saying, I can't do it, you've said, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it, but I need you to work through me to give me the strength to do that. I've experienced that a number of times, and it is an awesome feeling when God works through you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And his strength is always sufficient for the task. Caleb experienced that. He looks at the hills and he says, I know there's Anakim up there. By the way, the sons of Anak were giants. They're from the Nephilim. And if you're in the Bible 101, we're going to talk about those in a couple weeks. But these were big dudes. And it says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 9, verse 2, that they were very great in the land. And Caleb says, you know, they're big. They're real big. They're real strong. They don't hold a candle to my God. Thank you, Jesus. And so I'm going to go take them down. Yes, sir. And you know, what, you know what I love about Caleb? Because I'll go back a little bit. He says, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out. It may be. <laughs> I sure hope he shows up. But even if he doesn't, it's going to be, it's going to be a good way to go out. But he puts himself out there, and God does an amazing thing. He drives him out. It says in Joshua 15, 14, And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. No matter how big the problem, no matter how giant it may seem, God will give you strength yes, to win the battle. Here's one other characteristic of a relentless servant. An unfading duty to the next generation. Because at the age of 85, Caleb is not thinking just about himself. He doesn't have a whole lot of life left to live. He's thinking about his descendants, his children, his grandchildren, the next generation of Israelites. This isn't all about Caleb. It's about them too. See, here's what it says in Numbers 14, 24. God made this promise. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went and his descendants shall possess it. Caleb will enjoy it for a short period of time. You know who's really going to enjoy that land? His descendants. He's doing it for them, not for himself. See, Caleb could have had this attitude of, you know what? I've, I've fought enough my whole life. It's time they pick up the, the baton and get in the battle. You guys want it, you go take it. I'm done. I've done my share of the work. I hear that sometimes in churches. You know, I did my time. 
because this was a prison sentence. You know, I, I worked with the junior high kids for, for years, but, you know, the younger people need to step up. Younger people need to get involved in ministry. And I agree, younger people should be serving in ministry, but so should we. Amen. Why are we asking them who are burdened with so much family demands, full-time jobs, while we sit with all kinds of time, money, expertise to give? It makes sense that we ourselves get involved. One of the greatest gifts you'll ever give to the next generation is the example of unfading service for our Lord. We could not do, and I would say for most churches, they could not do what they do without older people stepping up. I mean, think about it. Our major Bible study classes are taught by Wayne Hinkle, Wanda Brooks, Mark Gibson, Vicki Smith, people all in their 70s and beyond. If they weren't serving, there probably wouldn't be anybody teaching those classes. We've got people like Greg and Debbie and Virginia, Carlene and Alberta, who work in the front office, the tech team, help with facilities, serving kid men. Our marriage ministry is being led by two energetic older folks, Barry and Susan Dodson. We couldn't be who we are. I'm not even naming the ushers and the greeters of those of you who serve every week to make people feel served and loved in this church. It's a blessing to the families when you serve. It's a blessing to our Lord when you serve. It's a blessing to the guests when you serve. When you serve the next generation, you are of the tribe of Caleb. God can use us in that position then to challenge the next generation, which is what Caleb did. Caleb said, whoever strikes Kiriath Sefer and captures it, to him I will give Aksa, my daughter, as a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, as wife. And when she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she got off her donkey. And Caleb said to her, what do you want? She says, I'll do it myself. She said to him, give me a blessing. Since you've given me the land of the Negev, give me also the springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now, this was a in a time period when the way to find a wife was not to go to match.com. You know, <laughs> it was to accept your, your future father-in-law's challenge, which I think is brilliant. Caleb says, I want the kind of guy for my daughter that's like me. So tell you what, man, you want her? Go take that city. And, this, and Othniel says, I'm going for it. And he goes up there, he captures the city, comes back, and he says, yeah, you can take my daughter. Now, Othniel, what a, what a weird name. You may have never heard of this guy, but when you get to the book of Judges and the Israelites have rebelled against God, they find themselves in trouble. They're being attacked by the king of Mesopotamia. God raises up a judge who will deliver them. And guess who the judge is? It's Othniel, Caleb's son-in-law. Caleb inspired this man and his legacy is now living on through him. His daughter comes back to him and says, Dad, you know, you gave me a piece of land. We need water. Babe, you got it. Take, take that springs, and you, those are yours too. Have at it. He's thinking about legacy. He's thinking about the future. See, we, can, we could sit around in our older years and watch CNN, Fox News, and watch YouTube vloggers and listen to talk radio heads and get all worked up over about what's happening in our nation and how things are just kind of going down the tubes. And that's not going to make a bit of difference. What God is telling us to do is get out of your chair. You believe. You know the truth. You've experienced the power of God in your life. Keep it going. The next generation is watching let them see who our God is and what he can do. Older believers, God is calling you to come in and hold those babies, teach the children, love the teenagers, welcome the guests, keep this building useful and, and useful for the guests that come in and the people that it serves. Be involved in ministry. We need wise people, talented people, people with experience, people who know God in an intimate way to influence the next generation because you have so much wealth to give. 
Do you know the Bible records the names of all those spies that went into the promised land? But I'll guarantee you, you only know two of them. Joshua and Caleb. Do you know why you don't remember the other 10? They're there. They're there in the Bible. Nobody talks about them. History forgets those who retreat. It remembers those who have the courage to forge ahead, who sacrifice, who go forward relentlessly. You know, I'm not, I'm not really concerned what history, history will write about me. But I'll tell you what I am concerned about. I'm really concerned about what my kids are going to say about me, what my grandkids will say about their papa or their baba, what my great-grandkids will say about my faith and what kind of God I served. And you have that opportunity too. Are they going to watch you cool down, take it easy in your last years? Are they going to see you be like a Caleb and say, I'm not stopping until he takes my breath away? See, if I could say a word to you, here's what I'd say. You need to refuse to back up, give up, until you look up, stand up, speak up, and offer up everything God has given you and entrusted to you for the sake of the one who gave it up for you. And so I want to ask you, why are you settling for the mundane when you can take the mountain? Why are you doing that? Why, why are you just listening to the culture and say, well, that's what people do when they get old. That's just what you do when you retire. That's not what God did. God did not retire his purpose for you. He never said, good job, you're 55. Let's go hang it up. Let the younger generation take it. He says, no, I'm just getting started with you. And some of you, he's going to wake up in the middle of the night and say, yeah, you're 65 years old. It's time to go back to college. Some of you, he's going to say, you know what? It's finally time for you to get involved in youth ministry. God is calling you, and are you listening to him? He needs you. The church needs you. The world needs you. We can make a difference. We can take down giants with his strength. And so I'm going to ask you, would you be of the tribe of Caleb, the tribe of Bibi, the tribe of Wayne, the tribe of Barry and Sue, the tribe of Carlene, and say, count me in. I'm a relentless servant. And if you are, I want you to stand because I want to pray over you today and commission you, okay?